Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Academy's Financial Handbook and Accounts Direction webinar. Um, my name is Mike Farwell. I'm head of our James Cooper Preston's Charities and Education team, and I'm joined today by Darren O'Connor, who is a partner in our team. Uh, we've got a great turnout on the call, so thanks very much for joining us. So we ran one of these webinars last year. Um, we run one every year. Um, perhaps the first message is to say that there isn't really dramatic change in the two documents this year, but obviously important to keep up to date with what's happening. Our webinar will cover, um, some of it will be a sort of summary of some of the key issues in the documents, but we will focus on the changes in the two documents from last year. Hopefully on your screens you uh, have all the slides. Um, we'll be talking for around about half an hour. We have allowed some time for questions, so you have a facility on your screen to um, ask any burning questions, which we'll deal with at the end. In terms of the structure of the session, uh, three broad areas, the new Academy's Financial Handbook for 2017, the Academy's Accounts Direction for the 2016 to 17 accounts, and we'll cover some other topical uh, financial matters, the ESFA. Um, important to note, I think that there are new um, accounts direction and financial handbooks is issued every, every single year. The academy sector is, of course, a, you know, a really big sector now. There are now, at the last count, just over 6,500 academies, approximately 70% of secondary schools um, have become academies and around about 25% of primary schools. Uh, amongst that, there was 1,800 standalone academies and just under a thousand multi-academy trusts and multi-academy trusts are um, increasing um, quite significantly. Around about three quarters of those multi-academy trusts have, have two to five schools in them. So the vast majority are relatively small rather than the huge multi-academy trusts that we sometimes hear about. So Academy's Financial Handbook 2017. This sets out the uh, financial framework. Those of you that have been working in the sector for a few years um, will definitely recognize the 2017 handbook because it looks similar to 2016. Um, it sets out all sorts of financial management and guidance topics for um, academies. Uh, it was published back in July. It runs to approximately 60 pages <clears throat> compared to 59 last year. I think it's perhaps fair to say that 60 pages for any um, document such as this published by any government body is, is relatively short. I hesitate to say that it's a good read, but it certainly reads better than many other many other documents. Uh, who is it designed for? Well, it's designed for a whole range of people, members, uh, trustees, accounting officers, chief financial officers. So in that we would include obviously school business managers and clerks, the governors in terms of procedures that may be relevant, local governing bodies and multi-academy trusts, and last but not least, um, auditors. Uh, the principles in the, uh, the handbook, are, they were first designed, um, I think it's fair to say, for, for single um, academies, but I mean, the principles here are all relevant to multi-academy trusts, albeit that the governance, delegation and financial control in multi-academy trusts may be slightly more complex than and in a um, single standalone academy. Uh, the handbook applies from the 1st of September 2017 onwards. So those of you that you have interaction with Academy Auditors um, over the next few months, uh, they will be looking at the, the old, the 2016 Academy's Financial Handbook, which ran from the 1st of September uh, last year through to the end of August uh, this year. So the Financial Handbook starts with a foreword uh, fr from Lord, Lord Nash, uh, from the DfE. There is a strong focus in his letter um, on governance this year. Um, one of his opening uh, paragraphs in his letter is to say that financial management across the sector is of, is of a good standard, which is obviously great to hear that the government consider that, that considers that to be the case. Albeit there are a few cases, um, you know, which often hit the press where, where governance may not be great, but I think the broad message is that, that um, financial management is good. Um, he emphasises the importance of good financial stewardship for everyone involved with academies. There is a focus, as we'll see shortly, in the separation of roles between members, trustees and employees. He also mentions the several, seven principles of public life. And there's also a focus on refreshing skills and knowledge, especially in a situation if a trust is changing. And their experience at the ESFA is if there are problems in academies, um, in the um, 
finance or governance arena. Um, often it occurs due to issues around trustee skills and behaviours. So, so they're placing a great deal of emphasis on, on skills and knowledge to try and avoid these problems, particularly at a time of transition. So, for example, if a single academy is becoming a multi-academy trust. If we move on to the broad structure of the handbook, um, those of you that were uh, on the webinar last year will, will remember this because the broad headings are much the same, but I'm sure that will be some of you on the call who are not familiar with the detail. So the first uh, section outlines roles and responsibilities, which is um, very useful if you have a particular function in the academy to make sure that you know exactly what your role should entail and what you're responsible for. Part two outlines the main financial and governance requirements. Part three um, outlines what authorities can be delegated and on part four audit requirements. There are also various various annexes to the um, the, the handbook. Uh, one thing um, that's particularly useful is the I think the schedule of requirements, which is which is annex C, which outlines the things that you absolutely must do. So it's quite useful I think to spend a few minutes just looking at this annex, just to make sure that you're doing all the things that you have to. For those of you who are desperate for more information, there is a huge annex to the, uh, the handbook, which outlines virtually every single um, other source of um, information that you could possibly be interested in. So, if, But if there are any sort of particular issues that you want more detail on, that can be quite useful. So let's have a look at some of the key changes for 2017. Um, broadly, these are split into governance and financial control. And one of the key themes is the distinction between members and trustees. Um, in a single academy structure, trust the words trustees, directors, and governors are also used um, interchangeably. But, but technically, um, the, the correct reference for the purposes of the handbook is, is trustees. The key theme here is robust governance. So, in terms of the members, the members have particular powers. It may vary according to your particular academy, but often they can amend the articles of association. The, one of the main um, govern, governing um, constitutions for a, for a company that usually have powers to appoint or remove trustees. Um, there is um, a, a recommendation that there should always be at least three trustees. And in some ways, those of you who are perhaps familiar with the private sector, the, the members are, are similar to um, company shareholders. So, for example, one of their powers relates to um, appointment of auditors. If we look at the uh, distinction between members and trustees, so trustees will, uh, because academies are always their companies, will be the company directors. They manage the business of the uh, academy trust, and in terms of their functions, they need to make sure there's clarity of vision and direction. Uh, they need to hold the executive leaders to account, and they also need to oversee the financial performance of the academy. Uh, the Department of Education's view is that it should be robust government governance uh, should mean a separation between members and trustees, um, and their recommendation is that the majority of members should be independent of trustees. This, of course, may be an issue for many academies where the, often the members and the trustees can be the same individuals. I think the overall message there um, is that um, uh, in terms of member rules, it's a question of uh, eyes on but sort of hands off in terms of the detail. We're going to run a poll now um, just to get your, your thoughts on whether yeah, this is all completely confidential, of course. Does your academy meet these trustee member, member governance requirements? So you'll see there are three options um, on your screen, yes, no, or, or unsure. So we'll give you a few moments to um, uh, click on the relevant box and we'll see what the overall theme is from those on the call. So there's still people voting. Give you a few minutes more, a few seconds more, sorry. Okay, so we'll close the poll now. So just over a half think that their academy meets these requirements, which, which is good. Around about a quarter um, think that they, their academy doesn't meet these requirements, and around about 20, just under 20% think that uh, aren't, aren't sure, and there's a few people that, that didn't vote. Um, so there's perhaps a little bit to be done there for academies in terms of just making sure that you do meet these requirements. So I suspect this will be an evolving scene um, over, over a number of, of months and years. Uh, if we move on to some of the other themes in the document, there's reference to the seven principles of public life. I won't read them out. They're all there on your screen. Obviously, a great deal of overlap between all of them. 
but just a question of making sure that, that these um, principles are, are applied. There is now a requirement that the annual letters from the ESFA's accounting officer must be discussed by the board, so it would be sensible to have that as a board agenda item, make sure it's minuted and uh, also minute the action that you're going to take. Uh, there's more information now about improving efficiency. There is some reference there to the situation if your academy has a financial notice to improve. But there's also lots of tools which are available for um, academies to use in improving efficiency. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very explicit focus on the importance of addressing skills gaps on board, so encouraging academies to carry out skills reviews. This is something uh, which charities have been doing um, quite a bit of in recent times. And there's reference to a competency framework in the, in the Department for Education's Governance Handbook, which can be quite useful um, in carrying out that, that, that review. So that, so that review could cover a whole range of areas, including recruitment, induction, uh, training, etc. And it's particularly important uh, at transition points. So, for example, it may well be um, um, relevant to carry out such a review on transition from a single academy to a multi-academy trust. So there's reference there to the governance handbook. There's a bit more information about order to appointment, but that broadly is along the, uh, the lines of um, indicating that members are responsible for appointing auditors, requirement to keep your record of um, in key individuals on edge base, which is a department's um, database up to date. And when you're considering risks, it suggests it's a good idea to look at the ESFA's investigation reports when you do that. And um, I think the, 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 the point there will be to make sure that you avoid all the things that have gone wrong, which led to an investigation in the first place. If we move on to financial control, um, the first point updated reference on submission of budget information is a relatively minor point. There is now an explicit requirement that decisions about executive pay uh, must follow a robust um, evidence-based process and needs um, decisions need to be reflective of individual roles and responsibilities. There is periodically a coverage in the press about um, remuneration and academy situations, so there is now a requirement that you do need to carry out a robust process and make sure it's properly documented. A new term is also introduced, uh, repercussive transactions as well as novel and contentious require approval by the ESFA. So no, novel payments are transactions which the trust perhaps hasn't done with before or outside normal activities. Contentious are ones which might give rise to criticism of the trust. And repercussive transactions are those likely to cause pressure on other trusts to take a similar approach. Interestingly, one of my contacts um, had some discussions with the relevant people um, at the ESFA to establish exactly uh, what a repercussive transaction might be. There's no definition really. Um, um, the response from the ESFA was that they couldn't really think of a specific example. So I think rather than focusing on the difference between novel, contentious and repercussive, it's perhaps a question of whenever you're doing something a bit unusual that you feel perhaps slightly uncomfortable about making sure that you consider whether you need ESFA approval for that. <clears throat> There's some tidying up of the wording around delegated authority to make um, severance payments up to 50,000, etc. No dramatic changes in principles, it's just clarifying some of the wording. And there's also an update reflecting the uh, department's introduction of annual sector report and account. So uh, broadly that's it in terms of the, uh, uh, of the changes. So not dramatic change, but one would hope that as the academy sector has now been in place under its present form for several years now that we wouldn't be having dramatic changes every year. So on that happy note, I will hand over to Darren. Thank you, Mike. Before I start, there's a question that's come in that I'll just answer. The question is, will the slide deck be um, circulated after the, um, the webinar? And the answer is yes, we'll forward it on to all the attendees. Okay, so the accounts direction 2016 slash 17. I'll just start with a recap of what a section, um, essentially this document covers. So it, it, it's a document to help you compile your financial statements. It's made up of a mixture of a number of different regulations and legislations, and I've listed those there. Main ones being partly the Companies Act and accounting standards, the new accounting standard FRS 102 as of last year. The Charities Act, which then is broadly reflected in the Charity SORP, which was also updated in the last couple of years. You also have specific ESFA requirements 
and specific funding agreement requirements that may affect some academies. Uh, I think in terms of our general viewpoint is that fewer changes this time round in the accounts direction than there has been in the past, partly due to FOS 102 being new last year. And we've now got to a state of a, a steady state really within the accounts direction, which hopefully will please most involved. So in terms of the changes uh, to the accounts direction, I've noted down some of the main ones there. First one being that you can no longer defer your accounts within your first year. Within the Companies Act, you're allowed to prepare accounts up to a period of 18 months. This meant previously that academies that were um, converted after the 1st of March could delay their first set of accounts through to the 31st of August of the following year, uh, hence an 18 month period. This is no longer permitted. The ESFA have stated that any academy that has a fun funding agreement signed within that year they would be expecting a set of accounts for that period. The apprenticeship levy, uh, the accounts, accounts direction has stated how that should be treated, and that's an, an expenditure through your statement of financial activity. And it should also feature within your staff cost note within your accounts as a separate line. So that will be a new uh, disclosure this year. Teaching schools, the accounts direction this year has clarified that teaching schools uh, or teaching school grants should be treated as restricted income and should be disclosed separately within your fund accounting within the accounts. Main reason being to ensure that you're in, as an academy you're not using GAG monies to support um, the teaching school. They should be separate. Last one there, accounting policy for financial instruments. Uh, financial instruments became or came to the fore as part of the FRS 102 uh, accounting standard last year. I think um, the, the accounting policy was missed off of last year's accounts direction. It's now been brought in. Nothing to worry about. It essentially states that um, academies only enter into basic financial instruments such as cash and uh, conversely do not enter into complex financial instruments such as hedging instruments. Other changes, there's been some clarification around transfers of existing academies in and out into new, new academy trusts. Um, the disclosure should include a note that details out all the assets and liabilities that are transferred. And there is a statement that the, the note should be mirrored in the um, both the closing academy and the new trust, the trust that it's entering, i.e. they should be the same as it is a like-for-like -like transfer. Point two, land and buildings. There has been some clarification in this area, uh, in particular with church schools. Um, the accounts direction goes slightly further now in terms of when and what should be recognised within the accounts. It must be said that it's still slightly grey and it's unclear, unclear as to how the profession will, um, will uh, treat uh, land and buildings going forward. So I think this episode is far from over. Enhanced disclosures on the pension obligations. Essentially, there's just more information within the long pension note within the accounts. Uh, main changes around sensitivity disclosures, uh, which um, won't particularly change the accounts that much. And finally, they're worth noting the Equality Act 2010. This, uh, this is really relevant to larger academies, so that's defined as academies with over 250 members of staff. Uh, you need to disclose on your website gender pay gap information and other equality information. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but this was covered on an earlier Academy Update email uh, back in June and is available on our website. We'll provide a link to it at the end. Other accounts direction matters, um, not necessarily new this year, but worth touching on. Uh, trustees report. Um, uh, changed quite significantly last year, mainly due to the sort of 2015 requirements. Um, but it's worth just touching on a few of those here. For example, the arrangements for setting key management personnel remuneration is something that shouldn't be forgotten. Reserves policy remains an important and uh, a, a policy that is looked at quite closely by the ESFA. And just a reminder that uh, the preparation, the, the trustees report is an important document and it uh, shouldn't be left to the last minute. Uh, it should be managed by one person, so there's one style and one clear message throughout. MAP disclosures, multi-academy trust disclosures, just a reminder that within the accounts you will need to disclose 
certain cost items per school, likewise um, the fund balance carried forward per school, and also some details on central services. It's worth noting this and uh, collating the information as soon as possible to avoid delays in filing, filing your accounts. Related party disclosures, as usual, is a topical area for the ESFA and something they will be focusing on. So it's important to ensure that you comply with the financial handbook and that disclosures in the accounts are up to date and correct, including your trustees remuneration, disclosure and key management personnel. Agency arrangements. Uh, this was an update in last year's um, accounts direction, but once again, worth touching on. So by an agency arrangement, we mean essentially income that does not belong to the academy. Within the accounts, you should have an accounting policy if you are, uh, if you are affected by agency arrangements. And there should also be um, a note with sufficient detail disclosing the relationship. There are some pro forma wording within the accounts direction, which you can use. So moving on to emerging issues within the sector, um, as always, there are a number of changes and a, a number of um, emerging issues on the horizon. So I picked some of the more pertinent areas here. Firstly, the apprenticeship levy. I'm not proposing going into the mechanics today, but um, early evidence suggests that the majority of schools have not currently been utilising their levy, perhaps because it's new and it takes time to put the processes in place. Um, given that the ESFA place a, a large or they, uh, uh, quite a focus area is the value for money principles. I can imagine going forward that the ESFA will question schools that have not utilised their levy. So I think the message is where possible please do utilise. National funding formula, as we all know this has been rumbling on for a number of years. Previous announcements uh, included a 0.5% increase per pupil in 1819, increasing to a 1% increase in 1920. There has been some further um, details released in the last week or two, and most of the information is around how the funds will be allocated. Um, some of the headline figures include by 2019-20, minimum funding per primary school will be 3,500 per pupil. And per secondary school, that would be 4,800 per pupil. For more information, please see our recent publication in this area that is on our website, and we will uh, provide you the link towards the end of this webinar. Um, thirdly, on their purchase of computer equipment, it's just a reminder that there is an opportunity to pull resources to buy computer equipment at a significant discount. The deadline is the end of this week, the 6th of October, but you still do have time to sign up. And the last point there is the Land and Buildings Collection Tool. This is a new requirement. All academies need to complete a form by the end of October. Uh, the form is now live. It went live on the 2nd of October. And it essentially is a list of all the land and buildings that you currently operate from. So just before we move on, I do have a poll uh, that we would like you to participate in. And the question is, are you currently utilising your apprenticeship levy entitlement? The, the answers are yes, no, unsure, and it'd be interesting to see how, how everyone is doing. So we have had some results come in, but there are a few still remaining. I'll just wait a couple more seconds um, and we will close the poll there. So we have just under 15% have said yes, just under 60% have said no. So um, my feelings were uh, true in that area and unsure 30%. Um, so it sounds as though we've got a, a way to go on there. It only came into effect from the 1st of April. So um, I think it's something to look at over the next or coming year. Would it be useful just sharing some statistics with you? Uh, and most of these are based on the 2016 accounts. You'll see that the total accounts due for that period were 3,000, just over 3,000 sets of accounts. Most were filed on time, 93%, but that is a percentage down from last year. And you'll see there that we've got a qualified non-standard audit report. So these are where the auditors have raised concerns and have actually qualified their audit report in certain areas. Most of these qualifications were around land and buildings or um, trustee remuneration or related party transactions. Um, 
we do expect the qualifications to increase uh, uh, over the years, but, um, but, but hopefully not significantly. And then likewise, regularity report qualifications. So once again, this is where auditors have highlighted concerns around um, regularity or non-compliance with a financial handbook. Common areas are leases, um, not complying with financial procedures manuals uh, and the like. I thought it would also be useful just to highlight once again the deadlines. I, I'm not proposing going down line by line, but I will just pick up some of the important lines. Land and buildings return is a new return and is due by the 31st of October. And the academy's accounts return is now due by the 19th of January. Previously, that was the 31st of January, so that has been brought forward uh, and auditors and school business managers will need to plan for that. Thanks very much, Darren. So I think the overall message is that there isn't really radical and dramatic change this year. So those of you that were already familiar with the accounts direction and financial handbook requirements, I'm sure we'll be delighted that you just need to um, enhance your existing knowledge a little bit. Clearly, there are some messages about um, members and trustees and the, the, the distinction um, between the two and the question of assessing skills. Some subtle changes in the accounts direction uh, which uh, will need to be picked up by yourselves and the auditors um, and during the year-end audit process and uh, obviously the apprenticeship levy question that, that Darren's raised. We've had a couple of questions that have come in during the course of the webinar. And the first, do we expect the accounts direction to change significantly in the next few years? Darren, did you want to take that one? Yes, um, well, as I mentioned, I think last year was uh, saw a significant change and that's um, due to changes in legislation, FRS 102 and the SORP 2015. Um, the next revision to the SORP is not due until um, 2022. And likewise, we're not foreseeing a, a significant change to company law or, or, or company accounting standards, the FRS 102. So I think in short, we should hopefully have got to a stage of um, a steady state with just fine tuning of the accounts direction to take into account any emerging or changing issues that have occurred within the year. The, I think it's fair to say that the requirements for academies in terms of accounting flow from the um, requirements for charities. I think the expectation that charities have is that there will be no significant changes in the rules probably until 2022. So I must admit in this ever-changing world, it would be quite nice to have a five-year period with no significant changes. The other question that we've had come in is, are many of your academy clients doing formal trustee skills reviews? I think that the answer to that question is that not many of them have actually got to the stage of doing those reviews yet, but many of them are actually thinking about it. If the academy sector mir mirrors the um, charity sector more generally, I think many charities these days do know to carry out formal trustee skills reviews, uh, appraisals, etc. I'm a trustee of a number of charities and two of them are, I actually do have a formal appraisal every year. I have to say that it's a more friendly appraisal than perhaps ones that you might receive in the office, but uh, still an interesting trend that we may see move into the academy sector. So just in, in, in closing, I don't think that there are any, uh, any further questions. You'll see on that final slide there are various links for those of you desperate for, for more information and the webinar will also be available um, on, our, on our website for those of you desperate to listen again um, or to recommend it to your colleagues we'd obviously be delighted the more people will listen to it the better um, just in conclusion and thank you uh, very much uh, for joining us those of you who like to have your lunch at exactly one o'clock we'll be delighted to know that we're finishing on time so um have a have a, a good day and hopefully um we will um, be in touch and contact at future webinars we hold thanks very much thank you